every Advent we run into the figure of John the Baptist. Luke's Gospel says that John's mother Elizabeth was a relative to Mary, the mother of Jesus. So John is somehow related to Jesus as well, maybe a, a second cousin. Born a few months before Jesus, John becomes the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. People often imagine John as a bit of a wild man, right? Shouting in the desert, wearing clothing made of camel's hair, eating a diet of wild locusts and honey. An organic diet for his time. You know, his, his lack of demeanor matched his lack of culture. When people came to him to be baptized because they actually believed in his message to repent, he called them a brood of vipers. You're a bunch of snakes, right? Who told you to flee the coming wrath? He probably didn't read that Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Probably skipped out of that uh, course during seminary on how to be missional. John's primary message is one of repentance. Repentance. You know, that message makes more of an impact, I think, if we take a bit of time to explore the background for John. His father was a man named Zechariah. He was a priest, and he served God in the temple at Jerusalem. And Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, they were righteous people, but they had no children, and they were old. They were past the age where they would have been able to have children. So one day, Zechariah got, Zechariah got chosen to serve in the temple, in that place, uh, in the sanctuary, where he, he went in to, to burn incense to the Lord. And an angel of the, of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Zechariah, your prayers have been answered. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to name him John. The angel of the Lord also quoted a text from the prophet Malachi that spoke of one who was to come, who would have the spirit and power of Elijah, who would turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah obviously had some questions for the angel. Now, exactly what do you mean that uh, we're going to have a son? Do you know how old Elizabeth is? Do you, do you know how old she is? You know, I'm an old man, and my wife, well, she's no spring chicken. <laughs> it wasn't exactly those words, but I think you get the drift, right? He had some questions, he had some doubt. And why wouldn't he? And, and you would have, and I would have. But for his questioning, Zechariah was rendered mute. The angel said, you won't be able to speak again until all of these things will have passed. So despite his doubts, the word of the angel came true. And Elizabeth did become pregnant in her old age. And eventually, she bore a son. And they brought the boy to the temple on the eighth day to be circumcised, to be named as was the tradition. And the people, the relatives around Elizabeth and Zechariah thought, well, surely they'll name him after his father, right? Let me name Zechariah, Zechariah Jr. But Elizabeth said, no, his name will be John. People thought, John? John? You don't have anybody in your family named John. Why would you name your son John? Let's ask Zechariah. So Zechariah said, give me something to write on, basically, he said. Just, you know. So they got him a tablet, and Zechariah wrote, his name is John. And when he wrote that, suddenly his mouth was opened. And he began to praise God. He began to praise God. And what's known as Zechariah's song is found in the last part of the first chapter of Luke's Gospel. What you need to know is that it's a song of incredible praise and adoration to God for what God had done. That God had looked favorably upon God's people. That God had redeemed them. That God would save the people from their enemies and remember His covenant to them. That the people would serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all their days. So Zechariah's silence was broken by this outpouring of praise, adoration, and joy. Now why is this important? It's important because the outburst of Zechariah comes after this long period of silence, right? Months of enforced silence, during which he must have had plenty of time 
But think about what he had witnessed and heard in the temple that day. What this amazing thing that was happening to him and his wife may truly mean, might truly mean. No doubt that during his silence, he must have pondered about the words of the angel. He must have remembered that the words of the angel echoed what was spoken by the prophet Malachi some 400 years earlier. At the very, very last part of Malachi, which also happens to be at the very end of the Old Testament for us Christians, says that God will send the prophet Elijah, who will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. And then after that, there is 400 years of silence. 400 years of silence. And there is no prophetic word from God for four centuries. Now you think months of silence is hard. Think about how hard it was for the people of God to endure 400 years of prophetic silence. When the silence ends, when that silence ends, there is an outburst of exceeding praise and joy from Zechariah, the one through whom, and then through, by extension through his son John, that this prophetic voice of God is once again heard by the people of God. Right? The ending of Malachi is tied to the beginning of Luke, this revelation to Zechariah, by the same promise of Elijah, by the same promise of the one who will cheer the hearts of parents of their children, children to their parents, who will prepare people for the Lord. What seemed to be silence was actually preparation. Just as Zechariah was being prepared in his silence to be able to praise God, the one who would redeem his people, so also the 400 years of silence, seeming silence, wasn't about the absence of God, but rather it was a time of preparation for the big reveal of Jesus at the right time at God's timing. The truth is that newness, newness, often comes after a time of preparation. Newness often comes after a time of preparation. There are moments in our lives when we think we experience silence. Sometimes we think we experience the silence of God. But often it's these times of silence that prepare us for the experience, for the reality of something new in our lives, right? Our times of silence, seeming silence, are actually preparing us for the experience of something new, something profound, something transformative. How long is the longest that you've ever been silent? Not said anything. A couple of minutes, a couple of hours, I'm not talking about when you're sleeping, and we also know that some of us are not very silent when we're sleeping either. You know, we don't find ourselves often in the midst of silence. Our world is almost continually full of noise. In 2014, a journalist and creative writing professor from NYU named George Foy wrote a book called Zero Decibels. He outlined his journey to find the quietest places in the world, and Foy found that it was incredibly difficult to find places of unsullied quiet in the world. Any place that has artificial light can be ruled right out. Going underwater doesn't help because sound travels more than four times faster underwater and travels further underwater. There is absolutely no natural place on Earth that is completely free from human sound all the time. It includes Gordon Hempton, who is an acoustic ecologist. There are some places that are quieter than others, but none that are quiet all the time. I think we don't always think about this fact. Eh? We don't always think about this fact. In fact, we just get used to it. We get used to it. Consider this time of the year in particular. It's a noisy, busy time of the year. Right? We're bombarded with jingles, advertisements, music, all sorts of things, right? Some of it's wonderful, but there's always noise, always noise. Some of this noise we don't even think about. But this noise continually fills our ears, fills our minds, it fills our bodies, and it fills our spirits. And if we don't intentionally try to seek out some form of silence, not perfect silence, but silence that takes us away purposefully from all the noise that continues to surround us, if we don't take time to seek that silence, how well can we listen for a new word from God? 
We don't take time to seek that silence. How well can we listen for a new word from God in our lives? Maybe this year, as we approach Christmas, we might take time to try to be silent, to try to seek silence. We might make time for some intentional silence so that we might hear something new that God might be trying to say to us. It might be the best gift that we receive this year. John breaks the prophetic silence of 400 years, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Repent, repent, and follow is the message of John. But we hear it every Advent, right? We hear it every Advent, repent and follow. And sometimes it just seems to be more noise in the midst of the, all that other noise that we get used to tuning out. Because we hear it so often. The, the Greek word for repentance in Luke is metanoia. Metanoia. And it means to change one's mind, right? Change one's mind. To repent of a purpose formed or of something done. The change of mind of those who have determined to enter upon a better course of life. That's what it means, metanoia. Metanoia is both a recognition of sin, sorrow for it, but also a robust change, right? a change, a significant churn in us that results in different choices and different actions. Theologian Leonard Klein says that our world is in an era of tolerance and cheap grace. That we live in an era of tolerance and cheap grace where we dismiss sin and leave people feeling helpless and perplexed by what afflicts them. We dismiss sin and thus leave people feeling helpless and perplexed by what afflicts them. Repentance is something we hear often, and if we don't hear it with a sense of urgency and newness, someone hearing for the first time in a long time, we just might tune it out. We might just tune it out. When repentance becomes just a routine tidying up of some particularly messy spots in our lives, like throwing all the dirty clothes in a closet when company's coming, or moving all the clutter from one room to another. But knowing that soon it'll all return back to its normal place, before we know it, repentance then becomes an act of cheap grace, because it really doesn't cost us anything, right? It doesn't cost us anything, because nothing changes permanently. Are we truly then hearing what the Spirit is saying? Do we truly hear the words of John that we are to prepare the way the Lord, that we are to make straight his paths. I think Klein is profoundly discerning when he says that we are a culture that tends to dismiss sin, which leaves people feeling helpless and perplexed by what afflicts them. Let's say you go to the doctor with this pounding headache, and the doctor prescribes a painkiller that says nothing about you quitting your job as a human tech crash test dummy. <laughs> Wouldn't you leave feeling perplexed? And helpless? Why should it be surprising that people continually struggle with the same issues, the same challenges, when we won't actually confront the sin which lies at the heart of the problem? You know, we, we tell our kids how great they are, even when all that does sometimes is to exacerbate an already unhealthy level of entitlement. You're great. We assure people, we assure people but the, problem, but the problem is that they are misunderstood, not that they might actually be wrong, right? We tell people, oh, you're just misunderstood, not that you're actually wrong. But the good news of Advent repentance is that as we admit our sin, only as we admit our sin, only as we face up to the truth about ourselves in being filled with sorrow for it and making a real and fundamental churn and change in our living, do we encounter the God who truly forgives, who truly loves, who restores, who transforms, and who redeems us, who redeems us? The author Leo Tolstoy once said, everyone thinks of changing the world 
but no one thinks of changing himself. Right? Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. Repentance is about changing in ourselves, about a change in ourselves, so that we might become agents of God's change in the world around us. But it has to begin in ourselves. It has to begin in us. It doesn't have to be huge, profound changes all at once. Sometimes all that's needed is a minor course correction. Minor course correction. A seemingly small change at the time. But given the length of our journeys, right? Given the length of our journeys, a small change here can lead to a profound change in the long-term trajectories of where we're headed. Just a small change now can lead to a profound change in the trajectory of where we're headed. What we need to be open to is a new understanding of what it means to repent and follow Jesus. It's more than just feeling bad or saying sorry. It's about a fundamental change in direction. Fundamental change in direction. On the second Sunday in Advent, we light the candle of peace. And peace can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, depending on the context. Peace can mean an absence of conflict, an absence of war. Peace can also mean respite from a crying baby. Peace can mean detente in a particularly volatile relationship between people or a period of relative stability for a complicated business venture. But you know, that sort of peace is never lasting. Something always shatters human peace. But God's peace comes about because we know that in God's forgiveness, we are brought to peace with God by God's grace. Our repentance, our true churning, is a response to the forgiveness, to the grace, to the love of God. And when our repentance is more than just shuffling deck chairs, but is a real change of course, when our repentance is more than just shuffling deck chairs, but is a true change of course, when our repentance doesn't only address the symptoms, but gets to the cause, the peace that it brings will be lasting. The peace that it brings will be eternal. This Advent, this Advent is a time of expectation and preparation. A season of Advent offers the potential of newness, but that newness must be prepared for intentionally. We need to make room for silence. We need to make room for silence so that in that silence, in that time of intentionality, we might hear God's voice in a new way. Don't let Christmas creep up on you this year without something new being born in you. Don't let Christmas creep up on you this year without something new being born in you. Don't let an uncritical approach to the noise of this world drown out what God may be saying to you. Something new that God may be desiring to reveal to you. You know, it's not a simple choice that we make on the spur of the moment. Those choices often lack the discipline to last, right? It's not a simple choice that we make on the spur of the moment. Oh, I think I'm going to go and do this. The choice to repent, to make a change that goes deeper than just the veneer, that's more than just a cosmetic surface change, but one that is lasting and transformative, it takes time. It takes courage to wait on God, to wait for God, to wait for God's timing. It takes patience. It takes silence. But the new life that true repentance brings will be worth the wait. So here's what I want you to know. Don't decide right now. Okay? Don't decide right now when you're sitting thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. Don't do that. Don't feel like you've got to make a decision right now. This is probably the only time that a preacher is going to tell you, don't make a decision right now. Okay? <laughs> Take a time. Feel free to leave this place. Feel free to leave worship not knowing what you might do. Only that you will do something. Right? Feel free to leave not knowing what you might do. Only that you'll do something. Take the time. Take the time. Take the time in silence. To truly listen. To purposefully be open to the Spirit in the season of Advent. Do it deliberately. Do it deliberately. Take your time. 
And I pray that God's peace, born of real repentance, may become a gift of God in a new way for all of us this Saturday. Thanks be to God.